Okay, Miss Jacobs warned you, I really love Caravaggio. Man crush is her term, not mine, but she's not far off. I'd also really love to pause in our breakneck dash through art history to take a breath and look at one painter in somewhat more depth. My man crush aside, Caravaggio seems a good choice. He was not only an extraordinary painter, he was an extraordinarily influential painter. Past AP exams included a number of questions along the lines of, this painter was influenced by blank, and usually the blank was Caravaggio. So I'm going to spend more time on Caravaggio than our rushed pace really allows. And as always, I'd encourage you to watch the portions of the video that we're not showing in class. Yeah, I know. Geeking out again. But I am an incurable, wishful thinker. So I'll start with a teaser. This painting by Caravaggio is actually a self-portrait. You should recognize the subject. It's still another David. But which figure is Caravaggio? Let's watch and see. So here's a painting that my husband and I saw two years ago in Naples. It's entitled The Seven Works of Mercy, and I've listed the, se listed the Seven Works of Mercy on the right. Unlike your required Caravaggio painting, The Call of Matthew, this one doesn't, I think, grab the viewer right away. It's awfully busy. Caravaggio didn't usually have angels floating in from above, but here he does, and I think that Virgin Mary, Baby Jesus, and angels swooping in seem a little go for broke. Uh, and sorry about that, by the way, I am a huge Sandra Boynton fan, have been ever since I read her alphabet book to my toddlers and learned that U stands for ugly birds being ugly. Anyway, I think this is a painting worth spending some time with, as we did. If you study the crowded canvas, you can see all of the church declared seven works of mercy being performed by a rather unlikely cast of characters. So, for example, in the background, you see two men burying the dead. They're carrying a corpse, although all we really see are his feet. On the right, a woman visits an imprisoned man and gives him milk from her breast. By the way, this scene refers to an ancient Roman story. A woman helped her father, who'd been sentenced to life imprisonment without any food. This is how she brought him food. Pretty ingenious. A pilgrim, that's third from the left, and you can tell by the shell on his hat, asks an innkeeper for shelter. St. Martin of Tours, fourth from the left, has torn his robe in half and given it to the naked, crippled beggar in the foreground. Behind them, a figure that's been identified as Samson is slaking his thirst. So why is this a quintessentially Catholic counter-reformation work? Remember the allegory of law and grace? One of the big disputes between Catholics and Protestants erupted over Luther's claim that salvation came from faith alone and not from works. The Catholic Church defended the central role of good works, and here Caravaggio is lending his support to this creed. Yet even as he defends Catholic orthodoxy, Caravaggio breaks with the traditions of Catholic painting. How? Well, Caravaggio, saints and good Samaritans do not look all that saintly, do they? These mercy givers are, in fact, part of an urban mob crowded into a squalid city street. This was Caravaggio's Rome, a Rome of pickpockets, prostitutes, gamblers and thieves, and murderers like Caravaggio. As your homework reading noted, we know a fair amount of about Caravaggio, mostly because he showed up so often in police records. There's another important way in which Caravaggio breaks from tradition. Where are we, the viewer, in relation to this painting? Well, it seems to me we're in serious danger of being kicked or sat on by that man in the foreground. The painting bursts out of its frame. The head and torso of the dead man, for example, and the body of the prisoner drinking from his daughter's breast are off stage, if you will. TV and movie directors and cinematographers you now use this trick all the time. So here's a still from a movie that even the McConnell super geek duo saw over Christmas break. Notice how it's framed or cropped. You probably don't even notice this kind of visual trick anymore. You're just used to it. But when Caravaggio first broke out of the picture frame and let figures he was painting spill into the church aisles, or the laps of the faithful, he was breaking new ground. This technique is what art analysts call an open composition, as opposed to a closed composition where all the action stays carefully enclosed within the frame of the painting. 
So what does this open composition accomplish in artistic and narrative terms? Well, it draws us up into the picture. It involves us in the scene. Caravaggio's paintings invite participation, not just viewing. Paul is falling toward us. We are, after all, the future recipients of his epistles. And that soldier's foot is dangerously close to our head. And we can almost smell St. Peter's feet. Where's the rest of Holofernes? And did you remember, by the way, that the model for the maidservant was a woman who ran one of Rome's most notorious houses of prostitution, and the model for Judith was one of her top working girls. That, as I've already mentioned, was another big break from tradition. Okay, on to our required work. This is one of the most famous paintings in art history, and it used to show up in some form or another on almost every AP test. Now, it is one of our required works, and for once, I have absolutely no quarrel with the College Board. Before we hear about the work in the video and analyze it on a few slides, though, I want to pause for a minute and encourage you to talk about why this painting makes such a strong impact, why it was so shocking, and why it made Caravaggio's reputation as a painter, or, for that matter, why you don't see what all the fuss is about. So what do you think? What's the big deal? Our historian begins by talking about an earlier painting that Caravaggio did for one of his church patrons. You also saw this in your homework reading. Like many Caravaggio paintings, particularly the early works, this painting features boys, often in rather sensuous poses. And yes, his taste did apparently run mostly in that direction. But this early painting also displays some of the techniques that we've already talked about, techniques that would come to fruition in the calling of Matthew. So that's why I'm starting the video clip at the end of Simon Shama's discussion of this work. So before we get back to the calling of Matthew, let's take a look at the second of the Matthew paintings, which you also saw in the video. The third, St. Matthew and the Angel, was destroyed in World War II. So what do you notice about the composition? Well, once again, we see figures in the foreground spilling off the canvas and into the viewer's space. We talked about the artistic impact of this open composition. What was the theological or the religious point that this open composition was making? Well, we know, right, that the church wanted drama, they wanted spiritual power, they wanted an immediate impact on the senses. This was art as a weapon in a war. But and Caravaggio wanted all that, but he also wanted to impress on his viewers that Christianity isn't just about something that happened long ago in a galaxy far, far away. The men and women who followed Jesus, the men and women who condemned and crucified Jesus, the men and women whose death were saved by Jesus, was, whose death uh, was redeemed by Jesus, we are they. In a way, Caravaggio channels Luther, even as he remains completely committed to Catholic doctrine. He invites his viewers into a personal relationship with the scriptures. But the scriptures come to life not by meditating on the printed word, but by entering into the experience on canvas. They are experienced through feeling, really, much more than intellect, although I would argue that Caravaggio also appeals to our intellect. Ah! One of those funny slides I borrowed from somebody else, and so it surprises me. Your textbook continuously uses the term dramatic to describe Baroque art. So here's a question. How is light used in a stage production? And how is darkness used as well? If you think about it, in a theater production, the darkness is almost as important as the light. When we sit in the audience in darkness, the immediate distractions around us fade, and we're drawn toward the action on stage. Spotlights tell us where to focus our attention, but we know that the shadows may be hiding action to come. You should know the term chiaroscuro by now. Let's hope it comes up. Ah, there it is. Wow. Tenebrism, from the Italian word for murky, refers to the use of darkness as a dramatic device. It's really a subcategory of chiaroscuro and one of the innovations that later artists borrowed from Caravaggio. So here is a detail from the calling of Matthew and a comparison. Where have we seen that hand at the top? 
It's Adam reaching toward God and Michelangelo's creation of man, right? So what, again, religious point is Caravaggio making? Christ is the new Adam, undoing the failures of the old Adam. The similarity of the hand gesture is not an accident. So let's recap. In what ways was Caravaggio very much a Baroque painter along the lines of what we've already learned about the Baroque? Like Bernini, he took lessons in lighting and staging from the theater. Indeed, Bernini was heavily influenced by Caravaggio, whose work was already turning heads in Rome when Bernini began his career. And of course, they were really going for the same set of patrons. Caravaggio strove to make spiritual life immediate, powerful, emotional, a gospel that could reach those who couldn't read. And I would say Bernini was, in fact, trying to do the same thing. Caravaggio's paintings capture movement with twisting figures, diagonal lines. Again, we see a similarity with Bernini. But how did Caravaggio take Baroque drama in an entirely new direction? And before you answer that, I want you to consider this question first. Why do you guess the nuns who commissioned this painting sent it back? Well, this is not Filippo Lippi's virgin or Raphael's virgin or Leonardo da Vinci's virgin. This Mary looks old. She looks tired. In fact, she looks genuinely dead, not just sleeping peacefully before she is she ascends into heaven. Notice that her skin has something of a greenish tinge. Her body is bloated. And what's with that screaming red dress? And then, if this wasn't distressing enough for the good sisters, the word got out that Caravaggio's model for the dead Mary had been a drowned prostitute who was dragged out of the river. The nuns were appalled. And yet, surely the grief of the apostles and Mary Magdalene, she's the figure in the front, is so real. Christ had come to conquer death, but this painting isn't about the conquest. It isn't about eternal life. It is about the tragedy of death. But of course, that's also part of the message of the gospel. So you just saw this painting. It also appeared uh, in the homework reading, and it's easy to see the chiaroscuro and tenebrism in this work. Those dancing circles probably aren't necessary. But what other characteristic Caravaggio features do you notice? Well, there's that open composition again. Paul threatens to land in our lap. The groom, likewise, is clearly an ordinary man, occupied with his job. He seems really not even to notice a history-changing event right below him. Biblical events were real events that erupted into the lives of people like ourselves, and sometimes people were a little clueless about them. At least some of the figures in The Calling of Matthew, as you heard on the video, seem oblivious to what's going on. So Caravaggio's last years were grim. He murdered a man, maybe over a tennis match, maybe over a prostitute they both fancied. We know that Caravaggio got into duels and brawls all the time, and he was uh, not trigger happy, but sword happy. At any rate, our anti-hero fled to Sicily, and then to Malta, and then back to Sicily, where he died attempting to return to Rome. The beheading of John the Baptist was painted for the Knights of Malta, which Caravaggio briefly joined. It's, interestingly enough, the only painting he ever signed. And he signed it, as you can see from the bottom left, as if in blood. Violence permeates Caravaggio's paintings, as it did, it permeated his life. But Caravaggio's graphic depictions of violence also made both an artistic and a religious point. So let's return to the video. You may have run out of time by now, especially if you've had a good discussion. But if you have time, let's finish the story by taking a closer look at the painting you just saw, The Slaying of John the Baptist, and then returning to David and Goliath.